Hello and welcome to the next video in the A-Level Biology series. In this video we will begin to cover control and communication, focusing on communication within the nervous system. Our survival and safety depend on the ability to sense and respond to external environments which may be harmful such as extreme cold or extreme heat. A change in the internal or external environment is known as a stimulus. Receptors. These detect stimuli. They can be specific cells or specific membrane proteins on cells. Effectors. These elicit a response to a stimulus such as muscle cells or glands. And communication. This can occur via the nervous system or endocrine system involving hormones. The nervous system allows us to sense and respond to our surroundings and to regulate body functions. The nervous system is split into two parts. The central nervous system, or CNS, this consists of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, consists of all nerves in the body. Information is sent through the nervous system in the form of nerve impulses. Electrical impulses which travel along specialised nerve cells called neurons. Neurons coordinate the activity of sensory receptors such as those in the eye, decision-making centres in the CNS and effectors such as muscles and glands. The nervous system communicates by sending information as electrical impulses through a complex network of specialist cells called neurons. A bundle of neurons is called a nerve. Neurons have a long fibre known as an axon. The axon is insulated by a fatty sheath known as the myelin sheath. Myelin is a substance produced by Schwann cells. Schwann cells wrap around the length of the axon and a gap is left between each cell, leaving uninsulated sections of axons known as nodes of Ranvier. Electrical impulses do not travel down the whole axon, but jump from one node to the next. This means that less time is wasted transferring the impulse from one cell to another. Cell bodies. These contain a nucleus and many extensions called dendrites. The dendrites connect the neurons to lots of other neurons for receiving impulses, forming a network for easy communication. There are three different types of neurons with the same components but different structures. A is a motor neuron. These carry impulses from the CNS to effectors such as the muscles. B, a relay or interneuron. These are found only in the CNS and connect the sensory and motor neurons. C is a sensory neuron. These carry impulses from receptors to the CNS, which is the brain or spinal cord. A reflex is a rapid autonomic response between a receptor and an effector. This is when the body responds to a stimulus without making a conscious decision. A reflex arc is a pathway of neurons linking receptors to effectors, consisting of three neurons from receptor to effector. Starting with receptor, to sensory neuron, to spinal cord, to relay or interneuron, to the motor neuron, and to the effector, such as a muscle.
For example, in rapid hand withdrawal in response to heat. First, pharmoreceptors in the skin detect the heat. A sensory neuron carries the impulses to the relay neuron. The relay neuron passes the impulse to the motor neuron and the motor neuron passes the impulse to the effector, such as the biceps muscle. The biceps contract and the hand is withdrawn away from danger. Receptors are at the front line of an organism's responses. They are key to survival and function. Receptors are found in plants, animals and bacteria and essential for sensing the environment and relaying signals to generate an appropriate response. Receptors are highly specific and detect only one particular type of stimulus, for example. Parsinian corpuscles are skin pressure receptors and photoreceptors are light receptors in the eye consisting of rod and cone cells. When a receptor is stimulated to a threshold level, an action potential is triggered, leading to a response. When a receptor is not stimulated, it is in a resting state. There is a difference in charge between the outside and the inside of the cell membrane, generated by ion channels and pumps. The difference in charge is known as voltage or potential difference. When the receptor is stimulated, the cell membrane is excited and becomes more permeable, allowing more ions to move in and out of the cell. The flow of ions changes the potential difference of the membrane, creating a generator potential. The bigger the stimulus, the larger the movement of ions results in an increase in potential difference and hence an increase in the generator potential. When the generator potential reaches a high enough level or threshold level, an action potential will be triggered. The action potential is a signal which travels down the axon of the neurons and can be passed on to other neurons for communication. For example, let's look at photoreceptors in the eye. Photoreceptors convert light stimulus into an electrical impulse. Light rays enter the eye through the pupil. The light rays are focused onto the retina by the lens. The retina is the part of the eye which contains photoreceptor cells. There are two types of photoreceptor cells which are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Rod cells, yellow in the diagram, are found in the peripheral part of the retina and they give black and white or monochromatic vision. Cone cells, which are purple in the diagram, are found packed together in the fovea. They perceive colour or trichromatic vision. There are red sensitive, green sensitive and blue sensitive cone cells. Rods are more sensitive and work well in dim light. Cones work better in bright light and let you see in more detail. Many rod cells join to one neuron, known as the bipolar cell, so many weak generator potentials combine to trigger an action potential. One cone joins to only one bipolar cell, so more light is required to trigger an action potential. Nerve impulses generated by the photoreceptors are carried to the brain by the optic nerve. Here is how. Light enters the eye and hits the photoreceptors in the retina. Light is absorbed by light sensitive optical pigments, rhodopsin in rods, and photopsin in cones. Light bleaches the pigment causing a chemical change and altering the membrane permeability to sodium ions. A generator potential is created. If threshold is reached an action potential is triggered and passes along the bipolar cells. 
Bipolar cells connect to ganglion cells, forming the optic nerve, which takes the impulses to the brain for converting the signals into visual information. So how is an action potential generated? When a neuron is not being stimulated, it is at rest. Neuron cell membranes are polarized at rest, and the resting potential is minus 17 millivolts. The inside of the membrane is negatively charged, and the outside is positively charged. This resting potential is created and maintained by sodium-potassium pumps and potassium ion channels in the membrane. Sodium-potassium pumps move sodium ions out of the neuron, creating a sodium ion gradient, more sodium outside of the cell, and this gives the positive charge. The neuron membrane is permeable to potassium ions, which can diffuse in and out of the neuron. The graph shows a change in potential across a membrane in the process of generating an action potential. Number one, a stimulus triggers the opening of sodium ion channels. Sodium begins to enter the cell, making the cell interior less negative. Once the threshold of approximately minus 55 millivolts is reached, more sodium channels open and potassium ion channels open. This causes the membrane to become depolarized. Once the membrane potential reaches about plus 30 millivolts, the sodium channels close and the membrane undergoes repolarization. More potassium ions diffuse out of the membrane down the potassium gradient. This starts to return the membrane back to its resting state. The potassium ion channels are slow to close, so there is a short period where too many potassium ions leave the cell and the potential becomes more negative than the resting potential. This is known as hyperpolarization. Once the ion channels reset and the ion levels return to normal, the membrane reaches its resting potential. After resting potential is reached, the neuron cannot be excited again straight away as ion channels require resetting. This period of inactivity is the refractory period. The action potential moves along the neuron as a wave of depolarization. The wave moves away from the region going through the refractory because that part cannot fire an action potential. Therefore, there is a limited frequency at which nerve impulses can be transmitted and action potentials can transmit only in one direction. Action potentials are all or nothing. Once a threshold is reached, an action potential will always fire with the same voltage no matter how big the stimulus is. However, if the threshold is not reached, the action potential will not fire. How do two neurons communicate with each other? A synapse is a gap or junction between the neuron and the next cell. The gap between the two cells is a synaptic cleft. Synapses allow for rapid communication and signal relay across neural cells. This is how signals pass from receptors and effectors. The presynaptic terminal is the part of the synapse where the nerve impulse originates. This contains vesicles which contain chemicals called neurotransmitters. The postsynaptic neuron is where the signal is received by receptors and further passed along the cell. Neurotransmitters are short-lived molecules which bind to receptors, activating them. They are then either returned to the presynaptic terminal hole, or they are broken down in the synaptic cleft and returned. When the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, an action potential is generated. Acetylcholine, or ACH, and noradrenaline are examples of neurotransmitters. Synapses which use acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter are called cholinergic synapses. 
Nerve impulses or action potential reaches the presynaptic terminal. The action potential stimulates voltage-gated calcium channels to open, causing an influx of calcium ions. Calcium influx causes synaptic vesicles containing neurotransmitters to move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. The neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, is released into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine diffuses across the cleft and binds to receptors. Sodium ion channels open in the postsynaptic membrane, resulting in depolarization, generating a further action potential. Acetylcholine is broken down in the synaptic cleft by enzyme acetylcholinesterases, or ACHE, and the products are reabsorbed by the presynapse. The neuromuscular junction acts in a similar way to synapses. The neuromuscular junction, or NMJ, are synapses between a motor neuron and a muscle cell. The NMJ uses neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which binds to cholinergic receptors called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. The NMJ works in the same way as cholinergic synapses with a few differences. The postsynaptic membrane has lots of subneural folds or clefts, which store more ACHE and contain more receptors. This concludes today's video on the nervous system. Thank you for watching today's video. We hope to see you next week for the next video on control and coordination, which will focus on the control of muscle contraction.